Well, today is our Vision Sunday, and I'm so glad to have you here today to share this with us. It's the beginning of a new year for us, East Baptist Church, and as you as an individual. And uh, today I'm going to preach uh, what has become kind of a tradition in our church from uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Don't stand yet, but if you go ahead and take your Bible and turn there. We're going to preach from a very familiar text on the importance of vision this morning from Proverbs 29, 18. The psalmist said that he put the Lord always before him. The result of that decision was that that man didn't stumble. He was able to walk through a dark, difficult world, a difficult path, and yet because the Lord was his light, he let the Lord be the, uh, the founder of all his decisions that kept that man from stumbling And then no doubt when he made his way to the presence of the Lord, the Lord was able to say to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. Today I might want to ask you this question, what's before you? What's guiding your decisions? What's informing uh, the thoughts that you have, the decisions that you make? You see, all of us have something before us that's compelling us to go in a certain direction. And today I simply want to encourage this. Would you let the Lord and his word be your guide? I want to ask you to stand with me this morning, if you would, in honor of God's Word. We'll look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18, uh, together. I appreciate Brother Jesse's commentaries before the song this morning, and that he and I had not spoken, and he was absolutely correct about the meaning of this word vision, and we're going to rehearse that thought today. And the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It's a cause and effect relationship. In the absence of vision, people are hurt, they're harmed, they're injured, things don't go well. And here's the contrast now. But, the conjunction, he that keepeth the law or the vision, happy is he. Today, just for a few moments, I want to talk to you about the importance of vision. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, and Lord, for the chance, the opportunity to be assembled together Lord, today, a familiar thought, a familiar refrain. And Lord, but I pray it would not fall on deaf or dull ears today. Lord, we so badly, desperately need to keep you before us. Lord, we need to understand and have knowledge of your vision, Lord, lest we perish. And so, Lord, I pray your help with this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. Thank you so very much for being willing to stand each Sunday in honor of God's word. When I was a kid... I played a number of different games with my dad. I, I'm not a big gamer to this day. My kids like to play apples to apples. Um, I think the reason I don't like games is I don't ever win games. And uh, I, I, maybe I'm a sore loser. But as a kid, my dad liked to play chess. Now, everybody here know what chess is? That's a, an abominable game, I'm telling you. <laughs> And I guess it's for smart people. I I don't know. And they had the king, the queen, the rooks, the bishops. uh, What are they called? Little castles? Is that right? What is it called? Knight. Yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. And and my dad loved to play chess. And 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 I I I I didn't. And uh, but we always did. And uh, (laughs) I always lost. And and you think a more empathetic, sympathetic dad would let his son win once in a while? But my dad never did, although I think he probably tried to let me win. Uh, I I still failed to do so, and uh, the result was, again, I I lost, and to this day, I have an aversion to a chessboard and those pieces. Now, here's the reason that I lost. Um, I really didn't understand the concept of the game. I mean, I had a basic understanding of you move this one this way and this one goes this way and here's kind of what you do. But the truth was, as far as strategy goes, uh, tactical skills go, any real knowledge, fundamental understanding of the game, I had none. I did not have any knowledge of the game of chess. The result for me was that I always lost. I suffered harm. There was injury to my poor, fragile spirit. I did not do well... A lack of understanding always resulted in failure and loss. Now, that's a very important principle today that I want to try to get across to you and for you to consider. Knowing something, understanding something, 
always brings victory in that area. Does that make sense? Knowing about something, having expertise in an area, having understanding of the principles and concepts in play in an area of life will always bring success and victory in that area of life. And the converse is also true, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, a lack of appreciation of the dynamics in an area of life will always bring about harm, difficulty, injury to us. Now, that principle plays out for us uh, probably in a great number of areas of life. For example, um, maybe people have money they can play with in the stock market. And, and maybe, let's say you just received an inheritance today of $50,000. Well, it would probably be unwise for you without any specific knowledge in that area of life to begin to invest money there because most likely if you did without the knowledge, the fundamental understanding of the principles of the stock market, you're probably going to be injured, suffer lost, you might perish there. Does that make sense? However, if you read a number of books, if you did some research, maybe you had a degree in business or finance or in that area, and then they gave you that same $50,000, and you knew how to invest it, when to put it in and when to pull it out, then you might experience great victory, great success there. You, you might really increase your wealth. But to dabble in an area that you don't have understanding or knowledge is always dangerous. Uh, let's take something like a, a gun or a power tool or, or something you know, with a little bit of, that has a dangerous element to it. Uh, in the hands of an ignorant person, someone who doesn't understand the dynamics of that device, that can become a deadly destructive device. But in the hands of a man of understanding, in the hands of someone who understands the principles and dynamics of that device, he, he maybe could create something beautiful or be a very skilled marksman. In other words, there is no injury there. There's rather safety. There's, there's victory. There's the ability to win. Mastery. Understanding, knowledge in any area of life is the surest way to bring victory, gain, and success. But a failure to know the fundamental elements and principles in play in an area of life will always exact a price from our life. Well, as we look at the text today, that is the principle or truth that's being said. Look there again with me if you would. The Bible says... Where there is no vision, where there is no vision, what's the result of not having vision? The Bible says the people who fail to have it will perish. They will perish. The word vision in the text before us is an interesting word in the Hebrew. It's a word that means revelation. Uh, much of the way it's found in the book of Revelation, it means uh, that which can be known, that's what should be known. In other words, God reveals things and we know it. Perhaps the greatest revelation of all is found in your hands this morning. It's called the Word of God. It is the Bible. This is God's vision. This is God's truth. This is, if you will, this is God's very Word. It is His Word. And the Bible saying that a lack of knowledge about it, a lack of understanding of it in any specific area of your life will cause you to suffer loss there. No matter what the topic, no matter what the application, if God speaks about it and gives direction to it and you don't heed it, you cannot expect to have happiness, blessing, or winning there, but rather losing, injury, harm, and loss. Where there is no understanding of God's word, people always perish. People always struggle. Vision is used today, though, in what I'm going to call a popularized way. When we say the word vision today, you'll hear it often in athletics, maybe, or maybe in the business world. And, and, and this is our vision to win the championship, or, or his vision is to build this great thing. Uh, it's, it's meant in the word of goal or dream. Uh, for example, Walt Disney had a vision, and he articulated it. And his vision was to make people smile. He wanted people to laugh. Walt Disney's vision, so to speak, in the popular notion, is to make people happy, and the way he did that was through his theme park and movies. Um, there are other people who had that. Henry Ford had a vision. Henry Ford's vision was to have an automobile 
or for every family in the country of the United States to own an automobile. Bill Gates had a vision, if you will. His vision was to have Microsoft on every computer. And I'm glad to say that I have a Mac today uh, instead. John F. Kennedy had a vision. What was his vision? Well, among several, to place a man on the moon. Martin Luther King had a vision. What was that? For equality and civil rights. That was his vision. I had a simple vision, and that was for OU to win a bowl game. <laughs> and that was my goal. That was my dream. I rooted. I cheered. I even prayed. And alas, it happened not. And there's nothing wrong with a person having a goal. As a matter of fact, I, I just encouraged a few weeks ago, have a goal, have a dream, if you will, have a vision in, in that popularized sense. It's good for you. But that is not is what's being said in this text. The Bible is saying to us that where there is no understanding of God's word, of his truth, of his principles, and the application of them in areas of life, that people will perish, and that's why the conjunction there, but those who do get it, they do understand good words, they, they apply God to their life, happy and blessed is that man. The Bible, it's the same thought we might find in the book of uh, Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, where the Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people don't do well. My people are suffering my, my people are in needless bondage. My, my people are steeped in immorality. My, my, my people will not honor me. My people will not give, give to me. My people will not serve me. My people are in chains. Why? Because they are not applying God's truth and principles to their life. And when we violate the grand truth, the, 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 the grand truth that God is in heaven, and, he, and he's made this world, he's made us, and the principle, the truth that he states for us in this word, when they are not lived out and when they are violated, then we're going to break those things, and those things, as a result, will bring dire consequences to our life. We cannot sin, the Bible says, with impunity. We will be destroyed. We will be harmed. We will be injured. We will suffer loss. The Bible word is perish if we do not heed God's word. We must listen to what he says. You see, vision is not a man's idea about his preferred future. Bible vision is not about man's preferred vision for his future, but rather vision is God's idea and us taking that idea and look here and making that idea our own. It's simply saying this, I agree with God. And when you and I agree with God and do what he says in any particular area of life, happy and blessed and prosperous and victory, that man will find. Kazon in the Hebrew, revelation, understanding, agreeing with the Lord. Vision is God's truth, his word, his way of doing things, and then doing those things for ourselves. When people forsake God's truth and his knowledge, his word, his revelation, his vision, his understanding, the result will be people perishing, churches perishing, societies perishing, and even nations perishing. All those who violate God's truth and word in their life will suffer loss and injury and harm. Vision is not a man's generated dream, but God's will for your life and mine. That's why the second half of this verse now can make more, maybe more sense to us. But he that keepeth the law, he that understands God's vision, his revelation, in any, here's my point, I want you to get this, in any area of life will find victory. It's so important for us to understand. Today, I just want to ask you to think about this. Why is vision so important? Why is keeping this truth so vital? Because it is the deterministic variable in your future. I think today, I, I, what do you want for your tomorrow? What, what do you want for tomorrow? What, what do you want for your next week? Look here, look here at me. What do you want next month? What do you want five years from now to look like? 
What do you want to look like for your family? What do you want your future to look like in your business? What do you want your future to be like at East Lone Baptist Church? What do you want for our church? And if you want prosperity, if you want blessing, if you want happiness, happiness, then I want to tell you it's directly tied to your willingness to understand and apply God's truth and His Word to your life today in any and in every area of your life. The idea is perishing its future. Happiness, its future. How do I get to either one? By either obeying or disobeying God's word. It's important because it determines the quality of our future. Today, I want you to understand this. Your future and its prospect for good and blessing is not tied to some economic index. It's not tied to the physical cliff and what the, the politicians do about it. It's not tied to some scientific discovery or economic plan. It's not tied to some special talent or academic prowess that you have. Rather, it's tied to your willingness and ability to obey God, to listen to Him, and to accept what He says, and to trust Him and follow Him. For where there is no vision... Obedience to the truth of God's word, people perish. But happy is the person who obeys it. <clears throat> the word perish literally means this, to cast off restraint, to be lost or destroyed. That's what's happening in, in, in so many segments of our culture. They're casting off God's vision and perishing for it. We see it everywhere and all the time. That's why so much of our news is poor and bad. I want to tell you something today. If our country fails completely one day, it will be because the, our people of this nation have forsaken this book and this truth. If schools fail one day, and some believe they already have, it will be because there will be no more people who will stand up in those schools with that truth. Even if they institutionally reject it, individuals in it don't have to. That's why I'm so thankful for a number of Christian school teachers and principals we have in this church because they are being salt and light in a place where other people are not. Today, when marriages fail, when your home fails, it's because someone in it's not obedient to the truth of God's word. But happy is that husband and happy is that wife who does what God's word says. When the husband loves the wife and the wife respects and honors the husband and the children obey the Lord, then happy is that home. It's a Bible promise. When churches fail, and sometimes they do, it's because I tried some other way than this way. When individual people lose their way, it's because they've put down the compass and the guide to life. The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right to a man. And oh, isn't that true in our life so many times? I think I can do it. I think I can get away with it. I think I know better. There's a way which seemeth right to a man. But the end thereof, the latter part of it, the decision now seems okay and all right, I'm getting away with it. But the end thereof, the Bible says the ways of death, perishing, destroyed, to use Bible words. We cannot cast off God's word in any area of our life without damage. Today, a simple challenge and encouragement to you. Keep the Lord ever before you. Make his word your vision, your guide for life. Listen, if we are going to have a successful 2013 as a church family, then we have to follow the blueprint on these white pages in black ink. If you, want to have, if you want to have prosperity in your business, then you do what this book says. If you want to have a happy family, if you want to have a bright future, then you cannot abandon the words of the Scripture. Where there is no vision, the application of God's truth to your life, you will not succeed there. You need to learn to make God's ideas and thoughts your own. I want to encourage a couple places for you to keep God your vision before you to make this word prominent and prevalent. Number one, that's your home. 
your home. I'm tired of homes failing. I'm tired of it. Is it okay just to say? I'm tired of it. It gets, you know, hey, husband and wives, they, they bicker and they fight. That's because they're people. But look here, it doesn't have to fail. It doesn't have to fail. What will keep it from failing? Something like this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's God's vision. That's God's vision for your home. Man, for you to sacrificially love your wives. Take them to church. Lead them to things that are right. Be an encouragement. Nurture them. Treat them as especially as God says we ought to. Husbands, look here. This is not complicated. Love your wives. You don't have to have your way. Do things God's way. Wives, honor, respect, reverence your husbands. He doesn't deserve it. We'll never deserve it. We will try, but honor him, respect him. Hey, young people, look here. You don't know better than mom and dad. You well may be smarter than us, and good for you. But God says, obey your parents and the Lord, for that is right. And you'll be better for it and happier for it. You'll be more blessed for it. You'll be happier. It's a Bible truth. You can't work outside the boundaries and find the habits you're looking for. God wants us to obey his vision for the home. Okay, so you're at odds with each other. You, you, you duked it out, whatever. Okay, then what's God's vision? To for, forgive and to apologize, to make things right, to show some humility, to lose the pride. That's God's vision. For where there is not that vision, your family will perish. But happy is the man, and happy is the wife, and happy are the children, and happy is the family that honors God's word. Your home. Your finances. Do you know that God has a vision for your finances? God has a will a purpose for them. Money is a tool for you to be used for the kingdom's benefit. And by the way, for your own. Because the Bible promises if you'll cast your bread upon the waters in due time, it'll come back to you. If you give, it'll come back to you good measure, pressed down and shaken together through the hands of other men. God will give back to you. God has vision. Everything you own, everything God already gave you. The clothes on your back, the tie that you're wearing, the jeans that's on you, the tennis shoes, whatever you own, the home you're going to go home, the car you're driving, it's only by the goodness and mercy of God that you have a thing. He says this, steward it. Steward it. That means when you see someone in need, do something about it. When there's an opportunity, be a blessing towards it. When you can be a help, be a help. Honor the institution that God started the church to be a part of tithing to it. God has a vision, and, and there's no more uh, complete promise in the Word of God concerning those who give than in this area. If you give, and it shall be given to you. We reap what we sow. Look here, what's God's vision for you? Stop being a stingy Gus. Stop. You're going to get too reliant on that money, and God's going to take it away from you to show you who's king and boss. Who's provider? You'll perish. Money is not the end-all, be-all. It's a simple tool. It's a gift. It is the way the economy of this world works, and God says use it right. It's his vision for you. Have a vision for your home, your finances, and for your, how about this, for your daily decisions. I say this all the time. Decisions determine destiny. Decisions are like roads on a map. They take you somewhere. I make a decision in the moment, and I'm still where I'm at now. But that decision in my time, or in time, will lead me to some destination. Every decision has a terminal end. You may enjoy the ride to that end, but if it's not the right decision, that end will be perishing, destruction, difficult, hard. Think, think about the decisions you're making. Think about them. They lead you somewhere. They're taking us somewhere. As a church, as a nation, as an individual, for your family. Listen, the Bible says there is safety in a multitude of counselors. Please 
let this book be one of them. Please let God's word, his, his revelation, be part of your counseling in making any major life decision. Where will I work? Where will I live? Where will I go to church? What area of ministry will I have? Who will I marry? Where will I go to school? God help us all if we make those decisions with that, without that book's help in obeying its truth. Because the Bible makes it abundantly clear where there is no vision in the decision of any of those areas, you're going to suffer loss. You will suffer loss. Any decision that you make of any consequence in the coming year, let's, let's determine it in our hearts that this is going to be our vision. How about your morality? Your morality. <clears throat> Newsflash. We live in an immoral world. Filled with immoral people. Doing terribly immoral things. And they don't care. And they don't care who they take with them. The way that seems right to them, if it's not obvious yet, is obviously leading to destruction. It's destroying men's characters. It's destroying men's decisions. It's destroying their moral fiber. How many people today around us are perishing because they have forsaken God's way for their own? They're choosing to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season rather than understanding that it's so terribly bitter at the end. In 2013, every one of you will face moral dilemma especially you men, will face moral dilemma. You're going to face it. Even if you don't go looking for it, most likely in this culture, it will come looking for you. And I want to ask you a question. What will be before your eyes in that moment? The Lord or something else? Look at me. The Lord or something else? Because if it's something instead of the Lord, you can't erase the principle of the verse. You will suffer loss. Your morality. Your witness. Do you know God has a vision for you as an individual in terms of witness? That's why the Bible says you, my friend, are salt. And you, my friend, are light. <clears throat> now, whether you choose to shine or not is partly up to you. But you are a light. You have the potential. You have the capability. You have a preserving nature about you. The question is, will you let your light so shine? It is God's revelation. It is his will that we are to be ambassadors. We are to speak in Christ's stead. That we are to go into all the world. That we are to tell our neighbor about the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be difference makers in this world. That is God's vision for you. How long has it been that you've made that kind of difference? We need to keep these things at the forefront of our mind. How do, we, how do we make sure that we don't find ourselves in an area of life perishing, instead rather happy? Okay, here's the, the great big principle that uh, you know, we've studied so hard, long and hard to figure out. Look here, you read this book. You read it. Isn't that a novel idea for people who are called Christians? But how ashamed would so many be today if I said, when was the last time that you read it? When was the last time you picked up and studied it? I'm telling you, it would be a shameful thing today for so many. Shameful. Okay, I ask this question, how many people want to be happy? How many people want to be happy? Or every hand goes up. Okay. Um, he that keep the law, happy is he. Okay, happy is he that keep the law. Okay, so you want to be happy, then here's the way to be happy. Follow the book. Read it, follow it, obey it. Do what it says. You'll be happy. It's a promise. If God is in heaven, he's not a liar, it's true. How do you, how do you be happy? You, you read the book. You pray. Ask the Holy Spirit for illumination, understanding, knowledge. Oh, that's what that means. Oh, I get it. Lord, I'm not going to do that. Lord, I'm going to do this. I, I see it. That leads me somewhere. Lord, I, I don't want to perish. I'd rather have, be, find happiness. The psalmist said, Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with a whole heart. Why? Because David was a happy man. 
They said, the law is my delight. Why? Because he found prosperity in it. He said, unless the law had been my delight, he said, I should have perished. I should have perished. In this area of life, if I hadn't obeyed God's world, I would have perished. It, when, David, when I didn't obey God's word concerning Bathsheba, man, did I ever suffer loss. I killed a man. And I lost a son. I compromised my character and integrity. People in my country died because of my immorality. When David didn't obey this, and his family, his personal moral life, people perished. And they said, so what I do, I keep the Lord ever before me. I don't want to stumble. The law is my delight. Because when I do that, I find happiness. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to uh, Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. We'll finish with this this morning. In Psalms chapter 1, verse number 1, please listen closely to the truth of God's word here. It says, blessed, blessed, prosperous, happy, joyful is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in his, what's the word there? That's God's word, his truth, his revelation, his vision. His delight is in the vision of the Lord, the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And here's the result. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall. One more time. What's the word there? By doing simply what? Listening to God's word and obeying it. And God says, but the ungodly are not so. They have a different end. And it's perishing. The same thing we find in Proverbs 29. Why is vision so important? Everybody look at me. I'll be finished. My friend, because it's tied to your future. It's tied to your children's future. The decisions you make today, the direction you're headed now, if, if it does not agree with this, the destination will not be pleasant. It will not be happy. It's tied to your function. It's the, it is the, it, a direct correlation to where you're going. It's, to how, it's tied to how happy you can be one day. Today I want to encourage you. Would you keep the Lord before you? Today, there might be a specific area of life where you're trying to make a decision. Future, family, finances, business, service, Whatever it is, can I, can I implore you with all my heart, let God's vision be your guide. Let me ask you to stand this morning if you would. And we're going to sing us a verse of invitation this morning. If you'd like to come and ask God to be your vision, to, stay, to be before you, to, to lead and guide you through a particular decision of life, a, a particular time in life where you need his help and you want his wisdom and you want his understanding, you want to know how to play the game so you can win. And as we sing, I want to invite you to come. Would you even come right now, Jesse, as we sing? Would you come as we sing?